This program is funded by Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. The salvation of the state is watchfulness in the citizen. The thumping sound of a newspaper hitting your doorstep. The avalanche of lurid headlines hijacking you at the checkout counter. The flood of 24-hour cable news shows washing over your eyes. The deafening roar of scores of talk radio shows. The ping of Facebook and Twitter with their 12-second updates. Welcome to the media landscape of 21st century America. A far cry from what the Founding Fathers envisioned 250 years ago as the architects of a new kind of government. We the people in which the media were to play a vitally important role. And that's why freedom of the press was not the second or eighth or 14th amendment, it was the first amendment. But now we have come a long ways. Our 330 million citizens are being herded into vertical silos where the deafening sound of the echo chamber makes them embrace fake news, fiction passing as fact, biased reporting passing as objective reporting. The Founding Fathers would have a lot of problems with where we are now. But we have a role as 330 million citizens strong to push back against that and to honor the belief of the Founding Fathers that the media and the truth were to provide the oxygen that a democracy needs to breathe. What happens in a democracy if truth no longer matters? How do you make truth matter? And what is truth? The following program is designed to air out a number of those vitally important haunting questions via a series of community discussions held throughout Nebraska in 2018. Well, welcome everyone. I think it's time to begin. Um, so pleased that you could join with us this afternoon and evening for an issue of trust. Journalism and democracy are linked so closely together in so many ways that are important to America as a whole and its citizens. Journalism matters because democracy matters. Uh, the two are really linked uh, inseparably. And so that's our focus tonight, to explore those, the link between the two and the issues facing the news media today and how that in, impacts democracy also. Jenna, we're gonna turn our attention to you. You're a Nebraskan. You grew up here, you went to college here, and now you work for one of the nation's largest newspapers. So how does the national news media world that you live and work in differ from the perspectives we in Nebraska might have of that national news media world? Well, I think the common perception is that um, the DC media is out of touch with the rest of the country, that our lives are um, very different than the lives of most Americans. Um, and I think in some cases maybe there is a, a bit of truth to that, and I don't want to discount um, those sorts of criticisms which um, we're trying to take to heart and that we're trying to um, work on as we try to build trust with readers across the country. Um, but when it comes to the newsroom that, that I work in and the people that I work with, um, they're really not, I swear, they're really not that different than many of you. Um, my editor that I worked with uh, on the campaign trail and covering the White House, um, he's a pastor's kid from Minnesota. Um, our national editor uh, grew up in a tiny town in rural Virginia. Um, one of our other national editors grew up on a farm in Kansas. Um, I'm from Nebraska. Uh, you know, we bring birthday cakes in for people's birthdays. <laughs> uh, when people have leftover Halloween candy, they bring it in. Uh, we joke around. Uh, we know the names of our neighbors. Uh, we look out for our elderly neighbors. Um, when I'm on the campaign trail, I pick up postcards um, and mail them to my 96-year-old grandmother um, who reads them to her friends at, at dinner. Um, I swear we're not bad people. <laughs> and, and I swear that um, all the journalists that I know and I work with um, got into this because they wanted to um, be journalists who figure out what the truth is, who 
figure out what the facts are, who find ways to um, write beautiful stories that explain uh, places and people um, to readers who might not be able to meet those people or, or go to those places. Um, so in you know, admitting that there are things that, that we need to be doing better, um, I swear we're not, we're not terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Clark, you've had a lengthy career uh, in journalism, editorial writing, investigative reporting. You've seen a lot. You've experienced a lot. Um, based on the, your experiences you have, uh, do you think the current criticism that we're all aware of about news media bias is warranted? Well, I think it's warranted in the sense that uh, news people in the news media, like people everywhere else, as Jenna pointed out, we're just like everybody else, we have biases, but I think those biases are more on display now than they used to be in the past. Now, in the newspaper world, of course, we have that what we think of as a pretty sharp division between the opinion page and the news pages. And, and most, most readers actually do appreciate that. They understand the difference between the two. But I do admit that you know, as a news consumer, uh, when I go home after work and try and get caught up on the national news, if, if I turn on one of the cable news networks during those primetime hours, I'm more likely to see uh, people who are shouting opinions at each other than I am actual journalism, uh, or what I would consider journalism. I have a very narrow definition of, of what constitutes news. And so there's, there's not a whole lot of original reporting that's being presented, but there is a lot of uh, opinion being shouted back and forth uh, uh, during those primetime hours. And I think, I think a lot of people do define the news media by these national cable news networks now, for better or worse. In, in, in my, when I was growing up, I had no idea what the opinions or the biases were of Huntley and Brinkley or of Walter Cronkite or of Peter Jennings, and it, it, it just never, it was never an issue. But in this day and age, it is, and, and I, think, I think the media itself is partly to blame for that. And I guess I would just jump in and, and say that um, there are still nightly news broadcasts that are, um, you know, just filling one show and not 24-7 cable coverage. And um, I would encourage you to, to maybe flip to those instead. Um, there's a lot of really good, solid reporting that's happening um, on network television um, that might get lost in, in all the arguing um, if you just watch cable news 24-7. The young lady over here. Hi, I'm Addison Cassidy, and I'm a high schooler, a senior from the Norfolk Public High School. Um, and I just had a question, and it is, what would you suggest for high schoolers trying to find the truth in media? Like, how would you suggest avoiding fake news or, like, clickbait? That's Good a question. That's a great question. Who would like to tackle that one? I'll try, and then we'll let the others uh, chime in. Um, I, I, th I think the first thing to do is to go... F uh, your first stop should be with the uh, traditional news outlets. There are a lot of uh, non-traditional news outlets out there, and, and you can probably recognize them much more quickly than I would just by the types of headlines that they have, whether it's headlines that start with obvious clickbait that say things like, you'll never believe what happened to, or you know that sort of thing. If, if, you can, if you're visiting a website that's from a more traditional, reputable, uh, news organization, whether it's a newspaper or TV or radio in your community, I, th I think that's a good place to start. And then probably uh, you uh, maybe from there j just branch out to other forms of traditional media to make sure you're getting a good sampling. But, but the, the, the problem that, that I always worry about is that we're seeing sort of non-traditional news stories and some of the clickbait style headlines infiltrate into uh, traditional media. So you have to, I think even when you're at a traditional uh, news website, you have to have that filter on. You have to be keenly aware of what it is that you're reading and who actually wrote it. Um, at the paper where I work for right now, we have uh, what we call, we used to call them advertisements. They were just labeled as such. It was paid content. Then we started calling them sponsor stories, which was sort of a 
vague term, and, and now we simply just call them stories, but it's paid content. So, and this is on the Des Moines Register website, so you have to be mindful of that sort of thing and take a good close look at the headlines, the bylines, and then go from there. And one, one other thing to keep an eye out for, um, no matter where you're reading it, is um, the sources that are being cited. So anytime you get to the end of the sentence um, and they're asserting a fact, um, it should say something like, according to you know, census data, according to um, documents released by Congress, um, said this person, said one administration official, and, and really kind of analyze what that is. Um, if it's a document that you can research, maybe you can find that yourself. Um, if it's a speech, maybe you can find a video of it and kind of research it yourself. Um, you know, and, and the, the greater the number of, of people that a piece of information is, is cited to, um, probably the more that you can trust it. Uh, so in anything that you're reading, um, it's good to read with a skeptical eye and evaluate where exactly the information's coming from. I'd like to underline that, that we all need to cultivate our skepticism. And when we see something that is too wild to be true, it probably is not true, but we have to. Uh, well, nowadays. <laughs> well, <laughs> good point. I, I want to add, unrelated to that, at the World Herald, we call those things advertorials. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. While I am a member of the media and have been for nearly two decades, what is our responsibility as authentic journalists to combat fake news? How do we do that? Because it seems like the majority of us only care about the sensational. We don't care about what happened at the city council meeting. We don't care about what happened at the board of governors meeting. We only care about the bus crash where maybe somebody died or somebody's in trouble because that's what we spend our time clicking on and looking at. What responsibility do we have? How do we combat fake news? Because if we don't do that, if we don't start figuring that out and maybe it's too late, the battle is lost because people aren't coming to real news sites anymore. I go to CNN, I go to ABC.com, I go to Fox News, I go to as many liberal and conservative sites as I can because I don't trust a single one of them independently because I've got to do my own research because everybody's got a slant, everybody's got a biased opinion. How do we combat that as authentic journalists, journalists is my question. Jenna, you've dealt with President Trump who has helped make this an issue of the fake news, things like that. Any thoughts on Abe's question? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the things that we're doing um, to try to um, uh, rebuild trust uh, with readers, um, I mean, if you looked at, if you trust polls, <laughs> if you looked at polls, um, there wasn't a lot of trust in the news media long before Donald Trump came along. Um, there's often Pew studies that show people are um, spending less time consuming news in the traditional ways. And, um, you know, that's something that's been going on for a long time. Um, it's become um, politically ignited the last few years. Um, I would just say a couple things. Um, you know, uh, web traffic to the Washington Post website um, continues to increase. Um, subscriptions to the Washington Post online continue to increase. Um, we are seeming to reach more and more and more people. Um, and as journalists, we're trying to go to different places um, to try to encourage people to come to the Washington Post to get their news. Um, you know, we'll go on TV and talk about our stories. Um, we'll go on Twitter, we'll go on Snapchat. Um, any way that, that we can maybe engage a different audience that we weren't engaging before, we try to do that. Um, and we're also taking steps to try to be more transparent, to make it easier for readers to figure out where our information is coming from um, so that they can do that research themselves um, and come to their own conclusion. We have time for one more question and I'm thinking she has one for us. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Julia and I'm a journalism student at Wayne State College. 
And in one of my classes, we were discussing the watchdog idea of journalists. And they brought up the fact that there are bigger companies that are buying smaller newspapers and giving them run first sponsored stories. And I just wanted to know what your guys' thoughts on that. And do you worry about the monopolization of journalism? Frank, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I worry about the monopolization of journalism. Uh, there are a lot of bad things going on under that genre. There are, are newspaper chains that produce the editorials in the front office and send them out to all the, the different newspapers. And so there is the editorial voice has been essentially co-opted by a faraway owner. Um, there are regional copy desks now by chains of newspapers where the story goes electronically from Raleigh to Richmond to be edited and get a headline and then comes back to be thrown onto the printing press. Um, this all dilutes the local character that we think is so important, the local voice, the, the membership in a community that, um, that, makes, that has made newspapers so vital in our, uh, in our uh, constitutional republic for, for all these many years. Yeah, I worry about it. Yeah. Clark? Uh, did I hear part of your question was correct? Was, am I correct? It was about sponsor stories, paid. Um, it, it, just in the past couple of weeks, both the Wall Street Journal and the Des Moines Register ran four full pages of sponsored content or paid content that sort of dressed up like news. Um, it, it was actually uh, created by the People's Republic of China, the government in China. And in the Des Moines Register, it just ran within the main A section of the paper, four pages within the main A section. Um, to, you know, I look at that and I see that as unprecedented and I see that as very, very dangerous um, for a lot of different reasons that we probably don't have time to go into. But that's happening more and more. Uh, the Washington Post has run those same types of uh, sections. It, it literally is not an advertisement, it, it's government propaganda. And I have a lot of respect for the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the Des Moines Register. I, I, I think newspapers are doing themselves a tremendous disservice when they publish those. Um, well, I'm just so encouraged by this conversation that we had here tonight. Um, it's an important topic. It's um, a good one for journalists to not just be having with one another, but with having um, with news consumers, um, with critics of their coverage. Um, and I'm also so excited to see so many young people uh, in the audience. Um, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom out there um, about the news uh, world, um, but it is an amazing career. Um, it allows you to walk up to anyone and, and start talking to them, to um, go to places you might not normally go. Um, so I'd really encourage any of you who are interested in journalism um, to keep going with it. I'm gonna just open up um, and I'll just, for this first question, we can just go from close to me to far away from me and then after that, however we wanna structure it is fine. But uh, I'll start by asking, uh, the broad question is sort of, how do you see the role of journalism in a democracy? And uh, for those of you who are current journalists, maybe if you wanna talk about how you see your role, that, that would be great. But I'll start with you, Matt. You've been a journalist or now a journalism professor. What is the place of media and journalism in a democratic society? Sure. I as my job now teaching, I, I try to take a step back and, and look at this. And, and the thing that I try to explain to, to college students, to 18, 19 year old kids, is the importance of a free press. That our founding fathers thought that it was so important that it should be part of the First Amendment of the Constitution. And that that carries a tremendous responsibility the Founding Fathers believed that the free press was vital to the functioning of the democracy, and we have seen time and time again that that's true. And we are at a, 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 an interesting time in our history, and there are a lot of things going on both in our politics and in our media, but I think the fundamental facts are still there, the fundamental truth is still there, that, that good, useful, verifiable, factual information is vital to the functioning of the democracy, and we can't lose sight of that. Uh, it's, it's vital that we are a check and balance on what goes on in government, uh, and we're an objective viewpoint 
for our readers to be able to share those stories about what goes on in government uh, so the, uh, our readers can make informed decisions. Uh, and we may, may talk more about this as the evening continues, but sometimes the role of reporters is to investigate, to, to hold corrupt politicians or business owners uh, responsible, but sometimes it is just to be present, right? Because if nobody's watching, we don't know what's happening. And uh, I, I have to thank my husband for reminding me of that once recently. I was venting about something that I was like, uh, you know, this, this is a story that just feels so rote. It doesn't feel meaningful because that is part of the job sometimes. And he said, but imagine if no one was watching, you know? And I think that's, that's, a, that's an important point you raise. Matt, I know you're thinking about this as your students think about where they're going to work. How do you advise them? Uh, I, I have a little experiment with them uh, when we're talking about writing stories and and how to how to get an audience and how to how to how to interest somebody in a story. I said I want you to think about the last time that you watched television. And I asked them in the room. I say how many of you watched television in the last month? And they all raised their hands. I said put your hands down. You're all lying to me. They look at me strangely like what do you mean? I said well how many of you watch television with your phone out? How many of you watch television with a laptop open? How many of you watch television with a, a tablet? How many of you watch television with all of those things all at the same time? And they all start to kind of nod. And I said, all right, now answer me this. How many of you right now on your laptops have one and only one browser tab open right now? And they begin laughing. They're like, what? The, I can have only one browser tab? What do you mean? You've got browser tabs that are blinking, making noise. You've got alerts going on. Your phone's buzzing at you. You've got all kinds of things. And that's the world you're trying to birth a story into. You've got to arrest somebody's attention away from all of that. And that's the environment that you're competing in. So this, this sort of shift in print toward more magazine style that's sort of more analytical, the more narrative style has been going on for a very long time and it is entirely in response to this. It's just in the last 10 years it has accelerated in, in such a dramatic way. Uh, I want to get to the next question in just a moment, but before we do, I want to ask just one sort of big pic picture question that I keep thinking about as you all talk. You know, we've talked about the shift toward more narrative journalism, the, the need to, to, to grab audience, um, both to compete with all the massive amount of information that's out there and to keep up in this new media environment where the business model has changed. You know, there's so many reasons why it's more challenging to be a journalist right now. And I, we are talking tonight about trust and credibility. How does that, um, that need, that pressure to, 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 you know, to sell the ice cream and not just the broccoli, how does that affect the kind of work journalists are able to do and the trust that the public has in that work? I think um, most of our media companies have been around. The Hub's 150 years old. That trust has been built over that time. And I think that, that can't change no matter what the format we're delivering the news in. And that's the key uh, for our survival is people know that they can turn to us for an objective story, an accurate story, and a fair story. Uh, and that's the reason that we look at analytics so closely. Uh, and it does, the analytics do tailor the type of stories we do. Uh, we know that if a, if a story on a, uh, we recently had a story about a, a baby that was left on the steps at the Riverdale Church. Well, it was off the charts because people wanted to read about that because we know who he is 22 years later. That was a good story. And that was our story. Uh, so that was, uh, that's the type of information that today uh, gets an audience. And obviously, we're in the audience business. The Hub has 7,000 print subscribers. Online, we average a million page views a month. So that contrast, obviously, we're trying to serve, again, live in two worlds, print and digital. But uh, we know where the audience is going to be in the future. So we have to we have to follow those digital numbers. And I, and I think that can actually lead to problems. Um, there are a lot of, of news websites out there that put a lot of junk food into a, uh, into like a photo gallery type display, you know, top seven cities to live in if you're left-handed and yeah. click, <laughs> click, click. And every time you click, you're popping a new ad up and right. that's what they're doing. They're playing games with, with traffic. And I think over time, 
the audience gets kind of like, okay, this is this is garbage. This is this is not what I came here for, and it starts to have a, 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 a negative effect. It's not an immediate thing. It's not uh, you know, it's not the the local paper was caught making up sources or doing something like that, which would set your credibility on fire. It's sort of a, a slow like water on a rock, it's eventually going to wear it down. It's going to take a while, but it will wear it down. I think, I think news organizations have got to be cautious about that, sort of giving the audience what they want versus giving the community what it needs. And, and that, that issue of trust is, is, is central to that. All right, next question. I'm John, Stu John Stewart from Kearney. Um, we kind of already touched on this, but I'm someone, and I don't think anyone in my generation really buys a newspaper or buys into cable television. So I was wondering where you guys see media adjusting to, and then to add on to that, when I do look for media online, I find myself rolling my eyes a lot, like you touched on, Matt, a little bit with just grabby headlines <clears throat> that, don't, that don't have much substance. So where do you think the balance will be? And then also where do you think it, the media will shift towards for where we're getting our news in the future? The world's changed, and it's forever changed. It's going to be forever changed. I just think we're going to see a, a shift back towards trustworthy, local, verifiable news and information from companies that we know and companies that we, if not outright trust, have trusted in the past, can trust again. There's an office in town. We can go and we can talk to the human beings that create that news. Um, and we can say, hey, I was, I was thinking this, and it might have been a little bit different than the way you portrayed it, and I just wanted you to know. That has value. That has a real value in our society when you know, most people are just hopping on Facebook and, and, and spouting off. Um, that interaction is, is meaningful. So I think, I, think there's a, I think there's this pendulum shift happening here, and I think you're going to see younger audiences reaching out for more traditional sources of media, but they're not going to do it in the way that their parents or their grandparents did. We'll go to the next question. My name is Josh Harry, and I'm from Kearney. I, I would just like to hear all of your comments on basically this idea where we find ourselves in terms of we typically, we in general, believe only the information that already fits our preconceived notions, our, our predetermined beliefs. So if, if we read something that you know reinforces that, we believe it. That's real news. If we read something that contradicts that, then that's fake news. And, and the best example I can think of that illustrates that is, is thinking back to before Trump was elected, I remember he would constantly talk about the, the job reports that were coming out for Obama, and he would say, that's fake, those are fake numbers. And then the first job reports that came out once he was president, no, those are real now. 100% real, real. yep. <laughs> and, and I remember Sean Spicer saying, yes, those were fake before, but now they're real. And, and so just talk, I guess, on that concept. And then second part of that is, is what can we do as a society to help change that culture that we find ourselves in? I think our goal right now is to seek understanding with each other. And would I love to like have an opinion and spout it from Mount Olympus? I totally would, but every single time I go and interview people with whom I would maybe personally disagree, I always come away with something like, oh, all right, well, I don't agree with them, but I can understand why they might think that way. And I feel like if we can move toward understanding, we don't have to agree, but more of a mutual understanding, a more civil discourse so that people aren't hardening in their positions. I, I think that's what we're seeing is just a hardening. Um, and we have to find a way to, to move to the middle. And a newspaper and the media can do that. We can encourage that and we can report on ways in which people are coming together instead of being drawn like a moth to the flame of division. because. Division is frankly more, conflict's interesting, right? Uh, last question tonight. We know though, in, in, you know, especially in recent times, there's been a lot of reporting on how there are these major media conglomerates, Gatehouse and Sinclair, that are buying up local news stations and local newspapers. They're forcing layoffs in many instances. They're dictating coverage in many instances. The New Yorker just had a fantastic expose on Sinclair, which is, reportedly forcing its uh, television journalists to read prepared statements that are coming down from media headquarters. And Sinclair itself is owned by people who used to work for this current administration, which obviously presents some bias potential. Uh, so what can we at the local level, what can we as just general citizens do to help kind of protect the independence and the freedom of our local newspapers and our local TV stations, the integrity of those stations? I think it's very important that you make yourself heard. 
you can pick up the phone. Our editors take the calls, you know, we email. Um, publishers take the calls. They're real people. They are sincerely interested in what you have to say. Believe me, they listen. Because if they don't like what I write, I hear about it. And if they do like, well, you know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's important, like we do sincerely try to listen to people and we're trying to get it right. And nobody wants to see this shrink, okay? Uh, sometimes I wish we were a nonprofit and we could just take the business right out of it. But we are where we're at. And I think for those TV stations, well, Justin could talk about that. <laughs> you know, I, I, with Sinclair and all that, I think you guys have got to pick up the phone and call. And, and I don't know if you're advertisers, but maybe the money has to take a walk with that stuff. Turn it off. You know, if you're mad at us, well, still subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> this brings me to, we just literally got a couple more minutes, but it brings me to the, the last question I want to ask, and, and because of time, I need to ask you each to keep it pretty concise. Um, but as you look ahead, are you hopeful for the future of journalism? I better be, since I'm asking kids to spend tens of thousands of dollars a year to do it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I yep. sure am. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, look, we were talking before about you know, cave paintings, and I'm pretty sure we invented language so we can tell stories. The need for news and information is not going to go away. We're always going to need it. We're going to want it. I think what we're going to see is a, an overcorrection. The newsrooms will get too small. People go, gosh, I really miss that. Business will change. They'll move in. Money will come back in. Resources will come back in. It's, it's going to evolve over the years, but I don't think the, the need for good, verifiable information from a, from a trusted source is going to go away anytime soon. I think communities without media companies, local media companies, uh, we've seen the results of that. Uh, we've all know a community that lost their newspaper, uh, radio, local radio station, and it's, uh, it has an adverse effect on the community economic development. Uh, so I do believe there's a, a long-term future. Uh, again, we're probably not printing it on paper for you. Uh, it may be coming on a hologram in your kitchen. It may be on your glasses when you tap your glasses and it, you can see it. Uh, we don't know what that looks like yet, but it's coming. And there is a future. Obviously, uh, we've seen that on the digital side. Uh, if you would have told me when I was back here, from, uh, in 93 that the Kearney Hub would have over a million page views a month uh, looking at our information and advertising, I, I, would have, I would have shook my head and walked out the door because I, I would have found that hard to believe. But it's happening, and uh, certainly we have a role in protecting what goes on in our communities as well as, as in, uh, in democracy and making sure that we're, we're watching where those tax dollars are getting spent. Thank you. And I'm hopeful in part because of people like you who come out on a Thursday night when you could be doing anything you want and listen to a conversation and ask great questions about journalism, about democracy. Um, that's encouraging to see. So thank you all for being here. Thanks to our panelists, Sean Barenclaw, Aaron Grace, and Matthew Waite. Thanks so much for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, I want to start with you. How, how has social media, Twitter, Facebook, all of that, um, and also add alternative news services, some that aren't considered mainstream media, uh, how have they changed how the public perceives news and how have they changed your job as well? Well, I think they've changed my job and our job uh, profusely. When I got into the business 25 years ago, I kind of thought I would sit in my cubicle and kind of write anonymously, and yeah, my name would be out there, but it would just be me and, and the computer and going to tell people stories. Had no clue that it would evolve into the point where people were talking at me constantly, um, calling uh, me awful names. <laughs> and um, But really, um, making it a little bit harder at times to do the job. Uh, Mitch Smith is a journalist in the Chicago Bureau of the New York Times, and Mitch happens to be an alumni of the College of Journalism and Mass Communications right here at UNL. Um, a distinguished alumni. I, I, I want to ask you, Mitch, 
this is at the heart of, of an awful lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight. What is your definition of the term fake news, or do you reject that whole concept? Uh, and what does the adoption of that term say about the public's trust in media now? Sure. Well, thanks so much, and thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back. Um, Fake news to me is, 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 is not news at all. It's, it's stuff that's put out there intentionally to mislead, to misinform, to, to deceive. And it, it's the exact opposite of what journalists at places like the KNSA Star, the Lincoln Journal Star, the New York Times are trying to do, where you go out and talk to people and compile facts and try to get, get all sides, people who, who disagree with each other and put those views into a story. Where, where readers can understand both sides of a situation. So fake news to me is when people make up their own facts, when people are um, trafficking in, in rumors or innuendo or just perhaps things they wish were true. It is not, to me, news you don't like, news that maybe you don't agree with someone who's quoted in it. It's, it's news that's, that's meant to, to deceive, to mislead, and, and it's not coming from from reputable news organizations. We used to be uh, with, with primarily print journalism. You would go to a community and you would have the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sun-Times, and they were, they were polar opposites. And you'd have the Detroit Free Press and you'd have uh, the Detroit News, and they were polar opposites. But a lot of times people would subscribe to both papers to try and figure out what was going on in their communities. What's, what's changed that people a good many of our citizens no longer want to take in both sides. You know, I, I think they're, from talking to people, people of goodwill who maybe are MSNBC viewers and Fox viewers both, I, I think that what, what I've picked up is that there's a perception that, they're, that one side is right and, and on either side. I think that the way you work, work through that is to, for journalists, is to explain how we do what we do. We have conversations like these and, and we explain what it, it is. You talk about the Tribune and the Sun Times, they're both still in Chicago and, and, their news, and their tone is a little different. Their news coverage is often very the same. Their editorial pages are, are historically what's been very different. The Tribune's historically very conservative. Um, the sometimes liberal, and, and that, the, there's a difference there, and I think there's sometimes a lack of understanding between the wall between the opinion section and, and, the, and, the, um, and the editorial side of a newspaper or in a TV station between an opinion show and between their correspondent out in the field, and making sure that you're understanding that distinction I think is really key. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Andrew Ashby. Uh, thanks a lot for coming out. You guys are doing an excellent job. I actually thought Mr. Kelly actually offered a, a great segue for my question. We kind of live in a, uh, rightfully so, in a society that heavily emphasizes like diversity and inclusion. Um, and I just kind of feel like, as it relates to my issue of trust with, with the media, is that there is not a diversity of thought. And so there, so I would, I might buy the Sun-Times, I might buy the Tribune, but in reality, I don't really think that I'm comparing the two sides together by buying those because I, I might not feel, or in my case, I do not feel that maybe either one represents me. And so <clears throat> you mentioned you, you like the Washington Post. Um, you know, re fairly recently they, ha they did have a story that sort of cited a repeated national survey that um, cites the, the gap in political views among journalists and how essentially there is a wide gap as far as Republican versus Democrat representation. And so what I, what I am thinking here is that there is a diversity of thought. And so my question is, um, am I reading too much into that? Um, or do you believe that it could potentially be pervasive? Um, and just in general, what are your thoughts and what are your advice as far as how I proceed in that regard? You no, know, I appreciate your question. I appreciate you being here. I think it's an important point that you bring up. I, I would say, that and I, I'm familiar with the statistics you're talking about and, and, and party affiliation among among journalists. I, I would say that most everyone I've always worked with, um, I often don't know what mm -hmm. they. I don't really particularly care what what they think, it, and I and I try really hard to make sure any 
experiences or opinions I might have in my personal life, they, that, that they don't come into play at all. I think that that's, certainly journalists don't always get it right, but I do think we're, we're, we're calling both sides, we're making an effort and trying to get the different perspectives in there. And I also think, too, it's, it's a very fair question to ask if you read a story and you feel like, why wasn't there a Republican quoted? Why wasn't there a Democrat quoted? Why do we only share this view? That, that, that's a fair point to raise. I, I think that um, I think that case by case is probably the best way to do it. But, but, and, and, if you, and if you see a pattern with a, with a certain news outlet, that may, be, that may not be the news outlet for you. But I think it's an important question. I think it's a fair question. I do think it's something that most journalists really try earnestly to not impact what they write or how they do it. I mean, we, we work frequently, we're talking to politicians from both parties, aides from both parties, uh, uh, private groups from different sides of the political spectrum. Um, we're often sometimes the only people who talk to like, like the, the different sides on these issues, and I, I think there's real value in that. It helps us see the nuance, and we do try to get it right. But I would encourage you, if you do see an instance where you don't think it was right to write a letter to the editor to comment on the tweet to say, what, what, why wasn't this there? Because those are, those are fair questions and fair mm -hmm. concerns. Mm -hmm. I kind of think you're right, actually. Um, I think we have to have these conversations in the newsroom about are we going to those people that we don't necessarily agree with or don't necessarily have their voices in the paper, you know? Um, I'm lucky at the legislature because we have both conservative and progressive or liberal um, senators who get up on the mic and talk and we can, you know, cover both sides. When you get out of that situation, then you do have to work hard to seek out those voices. So. And one thing I would just add too is I think that there's there's that certainly political views and affiliation is is one important sorting uh, hat. I would say that I find that a journalist come where I work from, from a lot of different walks of life, from different parts of the country, from different different universities. There's different ways to make sure beyond there's different questions to be asking about diversity of thought beyond just political diversity of thought. And and, and are you and I'm not saying that it's always right on those either, but I think that that's important too and that there's value in, in having military veterans covering the army and having, and having lawyers covering the Supreme Court and in both of which the Times does. And I think that that politics aside, that perspective and those different experiences help inform the coverage in important ways. Evening, sir. Greetings. Uh, so the premise is that you are the fourth estate and we're talking about media in relation to democracy. And uh, so then the question is, how do you maintain the integrity? Well, in, in Nebraska, this is extra important because we have a single house, and so an informed citizenry is really that check and balance. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, extra important in Nebraska that we have good information out to the citizenry so they can respond to what's going on in the legislature. So then maintaining integrity uh, as a new service uh, in light of all the things that we've just heard about money. Money, money, money. Placement, uh, buzzwords, uh, um, the, the thoughts uh, that key people into emotional pieces. Uh, so, it, you know, go on the mainstream and look at uh, ABC News and the extreme weather and the breaking news. You can find breaking news a hundred times a day on television. And so all of that is about in colors and how it's placed and all that stuff to get readers and viewers. So how do you maintain integrity in light of the conflict, I think a conflict of interest in a lot of ways, uh, of seeking money, readers, viewers, uh, and where is the press responsibility around establishing that integrity and um, and maybe we ought to reinstate the good housekeeping seal of approval. Huh? <laughs> uh, how do we do that? I think that is such an important question because if we're being really honest, um, journalism has changed so much that it makes it so harder to do the stories that matter. We are judged on page views. Um, I have a page view goal I have to hit every year. 
And so is it easier for me to write about, um, you know, the crazy gruesome wreck or, or something like that or the, the cat video or whatever because I know my page views are going to go up. But what we've done at the Star is we've made it a point to focus on the watchdog journalism, focus on the stories that make an impact that improve our community then hopefully the community sees that they will support that type of journalism. And so um, what we have done is um, we have some reporters that do the viral stories, that do the aggregate, and then we have some stories, reporters that just focus on that impact and they know our page views are going to be lower. I do think it is, it is hard because, you know, we, we have reporters that worry every day that they're going to get in trouble for not writing that story that people are reading. Um, but we have really, really focused on local watchdog journalism. And what we're finding, it used to be a few years ago, nobody was clicking on those. You know, they wanted the quick hit, they wanted the sports. What did Andy Reid say yesterday? They wanted those stories. But now as we're focusing on the watchdog, when we did our secrecy project last year, I mean, it within a few days, it was up to 300,000 page views, which is pretty good for impactful watchdog journalism. So we have to keep a check in ourselves. I used to worry about page views constantly. And I would say, well, what if I aggregate this? What if I, and I just stopped. And, and so I do think that when we write stories that matter for our community, the community will listen and that we keep that integrity. I want to toss that over to, to Joanne, in, in part because covering the legislature and you do a really good job making, in some cases, really boring stuff that isn't clickbait, still making it interesting. I think that's part of, a, part of the integrity we're talking about. Right. So how, how do you do that? How do you go about engaging much, viewers on the boring stuff? Much to the chagrin of our online editor, um, I ignore that stuff. I and I can do that because I'm over at the legislature and I just, I mean, I, I'm, it's probably to my detriment, but I write the kinds of stories that I think people um, need, to, need to read. Now, they don't necessarily read them. I have some of the lowest readership online ever, but <laughs> um, I keep plugging away because I believe that that's... That's the role of journalism. That's the role of this newspaper is to let people know those things. I, I do take your point very seriously because how do you keep that integrity? And I think that as the business has changed, that's our job. That, that's really that we have to keep ourselves in check. Great. My question is in regards with um, something that uh, journalism has had a problem with for a long time, and it's how they make money. And the number one way they make money is through advertising. And um, with that, um, what is the future landscape for journalism and advertising? Especially now that like social media and online websites, you know, advertising really almost propagates this um, polarization. So how does, I just wanna see your guys' opinions on how the future landscape of the relationship between uh, advertising and journalism looks like. Wow. That's, a, that's, that's the biggest question, and that's one that we talk about in our newsroom every day. I had a conversation this morning before I drove. Um, I think that the advertising model is not working. Um, they're not finding a way to sell digitally at the rate that they were selling for print. Um, their circulations are way down. Um, we have to increase the digital subscriptions. We have to... Um, show our community why they need us and why we need them. And that's, the business model is just not doing that right now. And some places are. I mean, the success of the New York Times and the success of Washington Post for digital subscriptions gives us all hope. Um, but they're national publications. They're not, you know, it's not one community that they're writing about. So we're all struggling. I mean, um, our advertising, and they're wonderful people, it's just really difficult to tell people after 25 years or 100 years of getting the news at times for free that they need to pay for it. Hi, good, good evening. evening. Alison Armstrong, I'm from Lincoln. I'm gonna follow up with your discussion about fake news. Um, you said that it, you consider it 
information that's intended to deceive or mislead. But we hear the word fake news thrown around a lot about sources that we might, most of us might consider legi legitimate, legitimate news sources. Um, how can you, and we, help people to understand what genuine fake news is and what genuine news sources are? Because I see that as the issue of our times, um, because people aren't able to discern between the two, and unfortunately, some, a lot of people promote misinformation in that regard. So. I'd like your input. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that's a really important question, and a really, I'm really glad you brought it up, because you're right that you do, if you go on Facebook or you look in certain places, you do see things that would fit my definition. I know that other people have different ones of fake news, where, where they were not, there was not any intention to tell the truth and inform the public with that thing. And it, it's always a little bit case by case as far as what, what you would identify as f fake news, but, but there, there's things you can look for, there's things you can, there's just basic uh, ways to get a sense of whether something is, is real or not. One is, th is there a reporter's name by it? Is there a byline at the top? Mm -hmm. I mean, th that, that, that's one, it's not foolproof, but that's an indication that someone's putting their name with a story and saying, I stand by this, I wrote this, I compiled this information. Um, do you know the name of the website? And if you don't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not real news, but it means you should look a little deeper. Is there an about section on the website? Can you, can you see some of the other stories they've written? Can you get a sense, use your own intuition, use your own information to kind of see whether that is a legitimate news source? There's lots of great news sources on the internet that I discover every month that I hadn't heard of before. It doesn't, just because you don't know about it doesn't mean it's not real, but it's, it's a, if you haven't heard of it before, that's a sign you should look a little further. And I suppose the other is just look at their sources. Are they quoting real human beings? Is there, mm -hmm. is there direct sourcing of stuff? And if you see a lot where it says uh, reportedly said or um, told the Kansas City Star or told CNN, that's a sign that, that, that that's a, the more you see that, that's a clue that that person didn't actually do the original reporting. And that's one more kind of warning sign to take it with a grain of salt. And I suppose the last thing is, if it seems too good to be true, if it seems dubious but interesting, look around. Can you find a place that you do trust, that you do know is reputable, that, that you've had good experiences with before and have found to be truthful, that's covered the same information? And, and if that's a way to, to verify something that you're interested in, you want to know if it's real, but you're just not quite sure. But I, want to, I want to clarify one thing, the difference between your, your saying uh, an, an article that, that makes reference to a New York Times or Associated Press report and anonymous sourcing. What, give, give me that distinction. Absolutely, and, and that's an important one. It's not, if, if a story says, I, I write stories all the time that will, I can't confirm a piece of information that say the Omaha World Herald got, and so I might have to write on deadline the Omaha World Herald Report. It doesn't, that, that's just, that's being forthright about where you're getting your information. If every fact is like that, that's, that's probably not a terrific sign. Anonymous, but that's different, you're right, than anonymous sources, where if you're seeing key facts attributed to sources or people close to the situation or um, things like that, not real human beings, not real people, th there are legitimate reasons at times for that to happen, but that, that, that's a, that's a thing that you should be looking out for, especially if you don't know and don't trust the, the provider of that information off the bat. And one thing that I always do is I look at the URL and I copy it and then I put it in the search engine to see what other stories that they have done. And then just their headlines alone I kind of will tell you, okay, that's suspicious, you know, let me look on. But it's interesting because my husband is an English teacher and he has to teach his kids what sourcing to use, how to know if it's real, how to, it's not. And it's everything that Mitch said. And it's really, first of all, you have to know the site where you are. And Facebook, you know, um, I don't know how many times during the election my own family would come with these crazy stories that they read. And they said, no, but it was on Facebook. It's true. 
And I'd be like, no, it's not. And um, so I do think there are key things, but first of all, always know uh, the site you're on. And um, also, if it does have a reporter's name, Google that reporter and see what other stories that they have done. And it's unfortunate that we have to do this, but you really do. And I don't, I have now made it a practice. If I read something online that I don't know the source uh, and I don't know it, I do not tell anybody about it until I've done my own research because you don't want to just keep perpetuating that. So it's really, really important to know what you're reading. I think that the way these fake news stories get perpetuated is that people want to believe them. People want to um, spread them around. And so that's how that happens. Um, if I'm looking at something and I think, oh, gee, wow, then I definitely will look at the source. Um, and then if I don't know the source, as Mitch said, then I'll go and look them up. Um, unfortunately, a lot of places do not tell you who is funding them. So you might have to dig even deeper to see well, who's paying for this. Who's paying for them to say this? I have two sets of thanks I need to get out. First of all, these folks made my job so easy tonight. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and, and one and a half thanks uh, to this audience. You were civil, you were smart. I could tell none of it, nobody was nodding off. But especially to our questioners, I think they deserve a round of applause for offering us some really compelling things to think about. These forums were created by Humanities Nebraska as part of a nationwide conversation around democracy and the informed citizenry supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Pulitzer Prizes. This program is funded by Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment.